Alright, so we're going to talk about orthopedic implants. Just some really basic principles that I think you should be aware of or reinforce uh, maybe what you already know or have been reading about. Internal and external fixation principles. So a few things about internal fixation. Um, I want to talk about screw anatomy or uh, sort of these terms that you think about when you have a screw. So. Um, if you have your, uh, let's just say, uh, like a, oh, I don't know, 4.5 millimeter screw, that's your screw head. Uh, here's your, here's your, that inner diameter, okay, as referred to there. Uh, you have a little screw tip here. So that's the inner diameter, right? That's or your. Uh, core diameter, let's just say, and if it's a 4.5 millimeter screw, um, that is 3.2 millimeters. So when you drill your pilot hole, the pilot hole is supposed to be the inner, di the inner diameter, right? And then let's just say it's a 4.5 millimeter screw here, the threads. So where those threads kind of extend from side to side, that's your, right, that's your uh, outer diameter, right? So that's the outer diameter and this part is the inner diameter okay so whatever screw four or five screw you drill with a 3.2 millimeter drill bit for your pilot hole okay and if you're gonna do a lag screw you drill uh, 4.5 first to clear to clear these threads from here to here right that clear that outer diameter and then you drill your pilot hole 3.2 okay the uh, angle of those threads is the uh, pitch of the screw, okay? And, and the distance between them. So, when you're thinking about biomechanics of screw fixation, there's, there's a couple of things you can do. So, to increase the strength of the screw and resist fatigue, you increase the root diameter. Okay, that sort of uh, core diameter. To increase the pull-out strength of the screw, you increase the outer diameter and decrease the inner diameter, uh, or you know you can increase the thread density, um, thickness of the cortex, and use the cortex uh, which has more density, right? So uh, think about, uh, for instance, um, screw design, right? So a cancellous screw is designed to go in bone that uh, is just doesn't have a thick doesn't have a thick cortex so by virtue of where you have to place it you don't have a choice so with cancella screws uh, you can deal with these issues right in, in particular um, and uh, so what you have is you have uh, uh, a 6.5 millimeter screw so as opposed to you know, the 4.5 uh, we showed in the last slide, we can go back now. The 6.5 millimeter screw is going to have, you know, the screw head. It's going to have, you know, the root diameter, which is actually, I've drawn it smaller, but it's actually about the same. But the, but the outer diameter is much bigger. Okay, so the outer diameter instead of 4.5 is 6.5. So certainly the uh, relative difference between the outer diameter and inner diameter is much bigger. So here it's 4.5, 3.2. With a 6.5 screw, it's 6.5, 3.2. Okay? So you, you increase that outer diameter here, uh, and there's a relative decrease in the inner diameter, and that, that sort of increases your pull-out strength. Okay? But if you just need to increase the strength of the screw and resist fatigue, you, you need a screw that has a thicker root or inner diameter, okay? Now, what about cannulated screws? Cannulated screws, um, so they have a hole in the middle, right? So so here's that uh, hole, right? You need to put a guide wire in, in this space over here, right? So that's like your, um, you know, where you drill and have the guide wire and then the screw goes over that wire that's a cannulation well the thing is when you cannulate the screw you're basically hollowing it out so you are um, you are weakening the screw uh, to some degree 
Um, so uh, what you have to do is you have to uh, uh, increase the inner root diameter to compensate for that. But the thing is, the screw strength is minimally effective because the strength is increased by the radius to the fourth. Okay, so a very small increase in um, the uh, you know root diameter can drastically compensate for the fact that you're basically hollowing out um, the the central portion of the screw. Okay, and then you know there's a relatively smaller uh, thread width. Um, and uh, you'll see if you pick up a cannulated screw, you'll notice how it differs from a uh, standard screw. What about plates? Well, I'm not going to talk too much about this. I mean, the bending stiffness is proportional to the thickness of the plate to the third power. This is not something you get asked a whole lot, and certainly, um, you know, it is important. There are areas where certainly uh, plate uh, thickness is very critical. Subtrochanteric femur, for example. Um, unstable diaphyseal fractures. What about um, the plate? What's its function? Well, it acts as an internal splint. It helps to provide compression. And this is a concept you'll hear a lot of people say that the bone protects the plate. Right? So what do we mean by that? Well, certainly um, if you get good bony compression, okay, then that allows the uh, stress to be taken off of the screws and plate. Okay? So if you have um, you know, a fracture uh, like this one over here, um, if in fact this is one butterfly that you can key in and you can lag uh, and then you can compress this, you're letting the bone protect the plate. You're minimizing the opportunity for motion and stress on the screws and you often end up having to put a shorter plate than you otherwise would have if you sort of just bridge everything. In that case the bone is not protecting the plate and you need a really long plate to protect it from itself and to neutralize the forces on the fracture. So remember, if you can get things to key in, if the fracture is appropriate for it, um, that takes stress off the plate. So um, there's a lot of ways you can create an unstable contra construct. Well, certainly severe comminution is something you're dealt with sometimes. Uh, bone loss, either due to an open fracture or um, perhaps a patient with a bad periprosthetic fracture who has bone loss from prior surgery or something. Poor quality bone, right? So osteoporosis would be the prototypical example. Um, with newer locked plates, and um, uh, more rigid implants that we have now, we uh, are able to overcome poor quality bone to some degree, but still it's relative. There are going to be some patients you can have good bone and other patients where you just are struggling to achieve good fixation. And then some of its technique. Poor screw uh, placement technique um, can lead to instability. I'm not going to go into every finer point of that, but th these are some of the basics. What about the fracture gap? Well, I kind of said that the bone protects the plate, right? I think it's worth writing here again, right? The bone... Oops. The bone protects the plate, right? Remember that. Okay, is the bone protecting the plate here? Well, it's not, right? You have this gap and um, if you apply a load as is shown here, um, you're going to allow stress on that plate, right? Whereas if you get compression, uh, you're going to prevent that from happening. So it seems pretty simple, but uh, sometimes not always done. Um, fatigue failure can uh, occur if the fracture simply doesn't heal. So even if you protect it, the thing doesn't heal, you have a fracture uh, that's unstable, um, eventually the plate's gonna gonna break. Now this is an example of a recon plate which is a type of fixation that was used uh, more commonly um, in uh, previous years uh, to fix the clavicle for instance. Uh, recon plates uh, have a lot of cutouts. They're designed for sort of twisting and turning and making a lot of different bends uh, and when you do that to a recon plate you do set it up for uh, potential fatigue failure as well. It's something to keep in mind. Alright, so um, 
what's going on in this diagram? Well, this shows the bone screw plate relationship. There's different things you can do with a plate. Uh, we don't even talk about locking uh, fixation here, but um, uh, you can use the plate in a standard fashion where you squeeze the you know, the plate is the yellow thing here. You squeeze it down to the bone with cortical screws. You can do it as a locked internal fixator where you, the plate is not squeezed down to the bone. And you just put in locked screws, almost like it's, you know, an external fixator, but it's internal. Um, so uh, what's going on here? Well, if you apply a load to this fracture, um, if the bone is protecting the plate and you get nice bony contact, um, the deformity uh, of your fixation is going to be held in check, right? Uh, whereas imagine if you had a gap here, okay? So if this was a big gap and you apply this load, this is going to want to, you know, come across this gap here. Um, that's going to put stress on here. Now, if your plate is down to bone, which it's not here, but if it's down to bone, there'll be this sort of friction right in between the plate and the bone uh, so if you can minimize that represented by the yellow arrow you increase your stability okay um, so when you try to get your plate down to bone you get that plate to bone friction that's going to help prevent that to some degree and then the, the, the you know the last thing is um, you know fixation of your screw so if you have screws that um, are let's just say locked screws right so if you have a a uh, series of locked screws, they're going to be much more uh, resistant to bending and toggling. Um, if you have uh, screws that have improved uh, pull-out strength, uh, going back to, uh, previously to some of the earlier slides, so uh, you know the screw design allows you to resist pull-out, well that's going to improve uh, your plate fixation for a case like this. So those are the three things, right? starts with protecting the uh, plate with the bone and then plate to bone friction and then screw pull out. So the screws closest to the fracture see the most force, right? So let's just say you can barely see it. There's a fracture line right about there. So you know this is a diaphyseal forearm fracture typically treated with um, if it's transverse or short oblique like that, a six hole compression plate. Um, the uh, so the greatest stress is going to be on these two screws and then it drops off as you go to the end of the plate. Uh, and the construct rigidity decreases as the distance between the innermost screw um, screws increases. Okay, so if these screws are close to the fracture site, construct rigidity is high. If the, uh, the two innermost screws are way out here, right, so if you take this and move it here and take this and move it here, or let's just say you just don't even have those screws and the first two screws are out here, well then there's going to be decreased rigidity in that, you know, for some cases you maybe you want to have some, you want to have less rigidity at the fracture site, and it's beyond the scope of this discussion, but just keep in mind as the, you know, you spread your fixation out with screws very close and very far, that increases the rigidity. Okay. As a matter of fact, I mean, some have even proposed a fracture like this in the diaphyseal forearm. You could probably fix with just one, two, three, four screws because you maintain your plate length and you need those two screws close to the fracture. And then really the ones in the middle, these two here and here, kind of play a minimal role. Now, I don't think a lot of people do that. Uh, four screws in a, in a plate like that. It's very easy to just put in the other two and it's a standard construct, but um, that's why that can work um, because of these principles. This is a question I get asked a lot. Um, how many screws do you need you know, when you're fixing a fracture? Um, and that's a, sort of a complicated thing. I'm not going to get into all that here, but this is a rule of thumb, at least for diaphyseal fractures. So for a mid-diaphysis forearm, transverse fracture or something like that, how much, how long does your plate need to be to neutralize it? And it's typically three screws on each side of the fracture. In the humerus, it's three to four, and the tibia, it's four, and the femur, it's four to five. So this is mid-shaft fracture, plating in the middle, compressing. How long does that plate need to be, and how many screws do you need to neutralize the, the deforming forces? And I think this is a good rule of thumb. 
So I'm going to stop there and uh, we'll get into XFIX in the next talk. Thank you.